Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, and talk to you uh, today and tomorrow afternoon about uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, uh, and please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Uh, just when you ask questions, please speak loudly. Uh, I don't have the best hearing anymore, so um, hopefully I'll uh, be able to hear the questions well if you speak uh, uh, loudly. Okay. Um, uh, as Ed said, I'm not uh, a combustion expert. Uh, when I was in uh, graduate school, I did take a combustion course uh, from uh, uh, Adel Serafin, who's one of the you know, uh, greats in the field of uh, combustion. And uh, actually, Hoyt Hotto sat in on the course uh, also. Hoyt was uh, Adel's uh, thesis advisor. And uh, I, one thing I do remember from the course was uh, Adel and Hoyt uh, not always agreeing on uh, certain things and had some quite interesting discussions in front of the class. As a graduate student, that was uh, very impressionable on me. Uh, anyways, so what we're going to uh, talk about uh, today or, and tomorrow, I, I divided it into six modules. Uh, we'll try to take a break between uh, each of the modules uh, today and then tomorrow. Um, and we're going to start with the fundamentals of climate change. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, carbon capture technology first, what we call post-combustion capture, which is uh, basically end-of-pipe type of capture uh, from the smokestack, say. And the, the next, uh, the third module, we talk about how we can maybe integrate capture and combustion processes to make uh, it a little more efficient. Uh, then uh, we'll move on to uh, 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 tomorrow. We'll talk about, OK, you captured the CO2. What are we going to do with it? Uh, we'll talk about also a, a topic that's gotten a lot of press lately called carbon removal. Uh, when I talk about carbon capture, what I mean is capturing it out of the smokestack um, of a power plant or a, uh, say, cement plant. Uh, when we take carbon removal, we talk about capturing it out of the atmosphere. Some of those are uh, by chemical means, and some of those are by bio biological means. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus more on the chemical means, but I'll give an overview of all of that. Um, there's literally billions of dollars being invested in that field today. And then we'll talk a little about uh, policy uh, driving all of these technologies. Uh, let me stay before I start. I, I wrote a book about five years ago called Carbon Capture. Um, it's meant for the non-expert in the field, but, but, uh, but an educated audience, and explains a lot of the fundamentals. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, this could be a good reference book for you. It's, uh, it's uh, fairly inexpensive, like uh, 12 bucks or something, and it's also um, uh, uh, fairly short uh, to read, but it goes over a lot of the... Uh, uh, things uh, that I'll be talking about here and, and maybe in a little more detail. So let's start here with uh, climate science. Uh, uh, people think uh, the, you know, uh, cl uh, climate change is a topic that uh, has originated in, in the past 40 years or so, but in reality, uh, it goes back to the 1800s. Um, as early as 1820, uh, Jean Baptiste Fourier inferred that there was a greenhouse effect. He didn't quite understand the mechanisms in it, but he uh, he did infer that uh, that the Earth's temperature was warmer than it should be uh, uh, without a greenhouse effect. Uh, by mid-century, uh, in the 1800s, uh, Tyndale uh, uh, showed certain gases absorbed uh, uh, heat in the infrared and uh, which, which is sort of the basis of, uh, of the climate science. And in 1896, uh, Savante Arrhenius uh, published a paper stating a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere will raise the, the Earth's temperature by several degrees Celsius. So this is uh, back of the envelope calculation, but basically uh, the first climate model type of uh, calculation you see. Uh, on the next slide or two, we'll see how his uh, estimate uh, goes to the uh, compared to the uh, much more sophisticated models uh, we have today. Um, so, what is the greenhouse effect? So, without the greenhouse effect, um, 
the Earth's temperature would it be, the global mean temperature would be minus 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, that would not be a very uh, kind climate for us to live with. But with the natural greenhouse effect, which I mean the atmosphere that existed before the Industrial Revolution, back to the mid 1700s, um, we have a, a, a nice climate of about 15 degrees C uh, average mean global temperature. Uh, but since the 1750s, uh, the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have increased, a lot of it due to uh, combustion processes, but not solely due to that. And that's called what we have an enhanced greenhouse effect. And there's something called climate sensitivity, saying if we double uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, how much will the temperature rise be? There's still quite a bit of uncertainty in that, but uh, uh, the, the, the latest thinking is it would be about a three degrees centigrade rise if we double uh, the, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And that matches actually uh, quite well with uh, Arrhenius's calculation, uh, and he did not have uh, um, all the fancy computers that we use today to do those calculations. So what are greenhouse gases? What, what, what contributes to this warming? Let's see if uh, we can see the, okay, there we go, the red, I can see the red dot. So uh, on the left-hand side, this is radiative forcing. Uh, basically, uh, how much heat watts per meter squared increase we get uh, due to the greenhouse gases. And this is uh, the change in uh, temperature from those greenhouse gases all the way integrated from uh, 1750, uh, in this case, up to 2019. This comes from the IPCC assessment report. The IPCC is the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is their sixth assessment report. They've putting, been putting out assessment reports uh, for over 30 years now. Uh, this last one was the most comprehensive. It actually, they, they come in three packages. They have a report on the science, they have a report on the uh, impacts, and they have a report on the um, sort of the mitigation uh, uh, technologies. So they have three working groups, and just recently, a couple months ago, they put out, uh, they, each of these uh, put out a report, then a summary for policymakers, and just recently they put out uh, the, uh, a report, uh, a summary for policymakers combining all three uh, reports, and that uh, was in the press, I think, just about a month ago. Uh, as you can see here, the most uh, significant greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. Um, methane is also an important greenhouse gas. And here, uh, the orange stripe is, is the direct radiative forcing from the methane, but there's also indirect impacts, and this is caused by um, uh, the atmospheric chemistry, and so uh, uh, in that respect is uh, amplified. Uh, you see something like N2O, and that radio forcing is mainly from agriculture, the use of uh, ammonia fertilizers. Um, uh, I should say methane is not just from uh, the methane gas we use um, uh, for, for combustion, but also things like rice paddies emit methane gas, uh, and livestock is a big source of methane gas also. Uh, you can see some things uh, contradict it. One of the big things is sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, they actually reflect light back uh, out of the atmosphere and, and uh, do a cooling uh, impact. Another thing you get from combustion is uh, black carbon, especially from, let's say, diesel, uh, and that uh, absorbs it, and, and that adds to it. So it's fairly complex uh, uh, what causes it, but uh, you know, the, real, the real main focus uh, is on carbon dioxide because that's by far the largest, and also there's been a lot of emphasis on methane uh, uh, lately also. There's something called the global warming potential. Oh, and 
uh, I should say, let me go back. Oops. The actually, even though CO2 looks like the most important greenhouse gas, really the biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. So water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas, but water vapor is something we don't control. That comes through uh, the hydrological cycle, and uh, therefore we don't look at that uh, as an anthropogenic uh, gas in, in this situation. Uh, there's something called a greenhouse warming potential. It's sort of a shortcut way to say how big an impact certain gases have. And on the previous slide, when, you, when we were looking at, at, those, at those things, it uses greenhouse warming potentials to, to compare different gases. This is on a mass basis. So for every, say, ton of CO2, um, if you have a ton of methane, its greenhouse gas wa warming potential is about a factor of 80 more than that uh, CO2. And that's using a 20-year horizon. And you see N2O is even a, a bigger impact. And there's other gases, uh, such as the uh, fluoro, um, the chloro, the hydrofluorocarbons, uh, for instance, have an even larger one up in the thousands. Um, but uh, there's a controversy on methane. If you look at the 100-year horizon, it's about a 30 impact. So if you want to say how important methane is to CO2, you use the 100-year horizon or just the 20-year horizon. Well, traditionally, uh, the IPCC has used the 100-year horizon. Uh, then there's been recent papers, most notably a professor uh, at Cornell, Hallworth, came out with a paper, and he was using the 20-year horizon. And you know, he was basically saying, well, because of methane leakage, uh, a natural gas power plant could be worse than a coal power plant. Very controversial uh, paper. Uh, uh, he doesn't have a lot of support on his side, but there's a, a, a lot in the environmental community have picked up on it. And uh, as you see, uh, um, just in the popular press and also in, in, in some of the actions taken, methane is starting to have a big bullet on his, uh, or a big target on his back um, uh, recently. So uh, that's part of the history of why. Um, so how do we uh, address climate change? Well, basically, uh, people talk about the energy transition, and that means we need fundamental changes in our energy system. And uh, when we talk about fundamental changes in the energy system, uh, uh, these are not little tweaks, but really significant changes. Uh, one reason we are not doing a good job on the energy transition is that um, fossil fuels are inexpensive. And unless you have strong policy, people are going to continue to use them. And uh, it's going to make the energy transition uh, very difficult. We'll talk about some of the policies tomorrow that are trying to move the energy transition. There's been some recent moves of some of the uh, bills passed last year in, in Washington uh, that, that have some hope here in the U.S. And, of course, around the world, uh, there's different countries have, have different mitigation measures, with Europe probably being the leader in uh, going through an energy transition. Um, so, you know, to do this, um, as they say, the solutions are challenging, and under the best of circumstances, it's going to take time for us to go through the energy transition. And unfortunately, uh, we do not have the best of circumstances, uh, uh, specifically here in the U.S., um, and the reason for that is if you're really going to make fundamental change, you really need uh, a political will. You need a, a, a country that's sort of on the same page. And we have a very divided uh, country in our politics. And somehow climate change has become part of the, um, what should I say, uh, has become a political issue when really it's really a scientific issue. We have a lot of facts. There's a lot of uncertainty in it, but uh, all, as we know, 
there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of the science, but we have enough certainty to really understand what we need to do. Oops. So I have what I call the climate diamond to help explain uh, how these things interact. And we can start here with human activity and our human activity for the use of fossil fuels through our agricultural practices, through uh, deforestation, uh, has released greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and that has led to their increase in the atmosphere. This uh, increase has led to an increase in global temperature, um, which is uh, the fundamental, uh, that's explained by uh, the fundamental greenhouse effect. And then that rise of global temperature has impacts on the Earth system, let it be sea level rise. Uh, uh, it's very hazy out there today with, uh, with uh, the fires from Canada uh, getting their smoke here. Uh, there's uh, uncertainty exactly how much of that's caused by climate change, but the frequency and the magnitude uh, uh, climate change has definitely uh, contributed to. And there's a whole long list of, of impacts, and those impacts on the Earth system have an impact on human activity. And then we go around the loop. Now, there's another arrow here that goes between the atmospheric concentrations and the uh, Earth systems. And I'll show that um, coming up in the next slide, uh, how, they're, how the, um, the atmosphere, the ocean, and the uh, biology, the, the vegetation, uh, all interact. And that's actually been good because it's limiting the, the buildup in the atmosphere that some of these other systems are taking the CO2, but can also go the other way. One of the fears is as we warm up, there's a lot of, say, methane hydrates in the permafrost and the tundra. And if that permafrost starts um, melting uh, and has started melting, there's a worry that these methane hydrates will be released. And as we see, methane's a fairly potent greenhouse gas, and there'll be a positive feedback uh, going there. So that arrow could go both ways. We can intervene. Um, we can mitigate the emissions uh, uh, from human activity, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we can adapt to the change in Earth systems. Uh, we can build um, dikes, uh, for instance, to protect against sea level rise. Uh, we can do uh, better fire mitigation has uh, uh, adaptations, and a whole series of adaptations uh, that we can do. Um, I mentioned CO2 removal, so we can actually remove the CO2 from the atmosphere and uh, put it in other parts of the Earth's system. And something that uh, people are talking about is uh, what's called solar, radi solar radiance management, uh, which uh, also referred to as a type of uh, geoengineering. And what that does is uh, to cool the Earth by sort of uh, the main, one of the main drivers they talk about putting sulfates in the upper atmosphere, as we saw, uh, I showed you uh, below, uh, SO2 is a coolant. So if you put it in the upper atmosphere, it will actually cool it, reflecting some sunlight back into space. And that will counteract the uh, uh, impact of, on the temperatures. Uh, it's not a direct thing. It's not as, um, you know, the, uh, you still uh, get warming from the increased greenhouse gases, but some of it will be counteracted through solar radiance management. I'm not going to talk about that here. Uh, once again, that's a very controversial subject. And if there's questions about it, I'll be happy to answer that. Um, so uh, what can we do if I'm going to go back here and just talk about mitigation? What can we do to mitigate emissions? There's basically three uh, things we can do. We can improve efficiency, uh, both on the supply side of, of supplying the energy, higher efficiency of power plants, for instance, or the demand side, uh, better use. Uh, um, compact fluorescence is a good example uh, on the demand side. You get the same 
uh, value uh, uh, of what we want, which is lighting, but for much less uh, energy use. We can decarbonize our energy system. Uh, we can go to lower carbon containing fuels, so we can go from um, coal to natural gas, and actually the U.S. has seen a fairly significant reduction in, um, in uh, our carbon uh, emissions um, uh, uh, earlier, the, you know, uh, over the last decade or earlier uh, in the last decade, we're starting to go up again, and that was because a lot of our coal plants closed and, and natural gas took over due to the fracking uh, revolution, which lowered the price of natural gas and increased its supply. Uh, we can uh, substitute nuclear for fossil fuels, and of course, there's renewables, um, wind and solar and geothermal. And finally, there's carbon capture and storage, which we'll be going into detail uh, here. And basically, that means uh, we'll still combust, but we won't let the emissions go into the atmosphere. So um, there's a lot of talk about our goals in the terms of climate change. And so what we want are uh, to get to net zero, these goals. Uh, and so a lot of countries uh, have announced that they want to be net zero by a given date, such as 2050. Uh, the United States uh, has announced that they want to be net zero by 2050. Um, so there's uh, two parts to that. There's a, it's net zero, it's not absolute zero. So net zero means we want to reduce our emissions, but there's going to be emissions that are going to be hard to reduce, and so we'll offset those. Examples of how to uh, uh, mitigate emissions include, say, on an airplane, um, substituting for jet fuel is not going to be trivial. Um, and so that may, uh, uh, we may use jet fuel for quite a bit and, and offset it. A lot of our agricultural practices, the use of fertilizer, is going to be hard to uh, change that, and so we want, we'll want to offset that. Um, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow, about uh, some of the ways to do that. Um, so, uh, if we want to uh, reach net zero, um, so <clears throat> let's go back here. So if we want to hit net zero, it means that uh, the carbon emissions, any, any inputs to the atmosphere will equal the outputs, and that will stabilize the temperature. Question is, what temperature? Uh, so in the uh, IPCC, they, uh, or the international negotiations, they say they like to do 1.5 degrees C, but definitely want to be less than 2 degrees C. Well, that implies there's a certain greenhouse uh, gas concentration in the atmosphere to hit that stabilization target. And that means there's something called a carbon budget, which means there's only so many emissions of greenhouse gases we can emit uh, to stay within that level. And I'll come back and show you uh, quanti quantitatively what those uh, numbers look like. But first, I want to talk a little about the carbon cycle. And this is from, once again, uh, an IPCC report. And what we see here, this is the basically the land. This is the ocean. And this is uh, what we have in the ground, our fossil fuels. And you can see, and this is in terms of carbon, not CO2 now, because um, the carbon is not always in the form of CO2. In fact, in the ocean, it's mainly in the form of uh, bicarbonate ions. And in the land, it's, it's in the form of biomass. Um, so um, what you see here, there's big fluxes about 100 gigatons of carbon a year going between the uh, land and the atmosphere, uh, 50 to 60 gigatons a year going between the ocean and the atmosphere. And before we started putting CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, which here, um, I can, let me see, read the number from here, 
uh, is about, it's a 9.4 there and another 1.6 from uh, deforestation. So you got about 11 gigatons of carbon coming up here versus fluxes that are over 150 gigatons. So you're less than 1%, I'm sorry, yeah. You're less than 10% of the uh, total fluxes uh, coming there, but the total fluxes before were balanced. So if you have a balancing scale and you have, um, you know, 2,000, uh, you know, 2,000 pound uh, weights on it on each side, the scales are balanced. But then you just put, um, you know, a uh, 100 pound weight on one side and it gets the thing totally out of balance and that's what we've done with our carbon cycle. Uh, as I say, you have about 11 tons of carbon going up, but only about, get the exact number here, um, only about five tons remain in the atmosphere each year. The rest of it goes back into the, either the land or into the um, ocean. And in fact, over, you know, this is sort of a year by year snapshot, but say the emissions we're putting up today, um, about 80% of those will eventually end up in the ocean. So the ocean's playing a very big role in moderating climate change uh, for now. And it's not just getting the carbon, but also increasing, um, uh, taking up a lot of heat. Uh, there was something very disturbing um, that was shown uh, last week that the ocean temperatures right now, uh, especially in the Atlantic, are by far the highest they've ever been by a, a good amount. And that uh, has people a, a little worried. So this here is the carbon cycle. And uh, we'll come back to this when we talk about some carbon dioxide removal. But the, the first focus will be on carbon capture, which is to reduce, which will be to reduce uh, the amount that's coming out from fossil fuels. So that's, I think that's got to be our, the primary uh, uh, focus. If we look at, coming back to the carbon budget, if we look at um, what our recoverable reserves are of coal, natural gas, and oil, and this is uh, converting them to uh, billion tons, gigatons of CO2. Uh, this was from a, a, a BP uh, statistic energy statistics, uh, uh, you can see how much fossil fuels we have uh, that are recoverable reserves. Reserves are an economic term, meaning these are identified, we understand where they are, we understand the cost of getting them out. Uh, the amount of stocks we have in the ground is significantly larger. Uh, this is an estimate of that. Uh, you can see we have quite a lot of gigatons of CO2 every year, uh, once again, the, the world, well, the world was putting out, as we saw in the other uh, thing, we're putting out into the atmosphere uh, 11 gigatons of carbon. Uh, if we uh, convert that into CO2, it's like 40 gigatons of CO2 uh, a year. And if we want to keep below 2 degrees C, uh, the amount of CO2 we can release between now and 2100 is about um, 1,000 gigatons. So once again, putting out about 40 a year, we're going to do um, um, 1,000. So that says in about 50 years, if we don't uh, get to net zero at our current rate, uh, we're going to exceed our 2 degrees C budget, uh, which um, the, the scientists said uh, is going to be highly risky um, to do. And as you can see, on 3 degrees C, it's... Uh, uh, a little bigger budget, but once again, uh, uh, people think it, it's taken too much of a risk to go there. So what can we do? What are the implications for fossil fuels? And at least fossil fuels with three options. Um, option one is don't combust. Basically, don't use fossil fuels. Let's uh, go to renewables. Let's go to nuclear. We can combust some, but not emit it. That's what carbon capture and storage does. Or we can combust and emit, but offset it, such as maybe we'll do that for airplanes, and that's carbon dioxide uh, removal. Um, as we move forward, 
and trying to deal with climate change. Uh, there's growing areas of interest. Uh, we want to use carbon-free energy carriers. Uh, right now, electricity is our biggest one. Electricity uh, um, delivers about 25% of our final energy. Um, people talk about intensive electrification, which means let's put more of our final energy from electricity, which means we'll have to grow our non-carbon, we have to grow our electricity systems and, and decarbonize the electricity systems. Uh, the biggest thing uh, I'm sure you're all familiar about, going to electric vehicles uh, would uh, uh, be a big uh, decarbonization. Uh, I forget, transportation is probably an, another 25% of our emissions. Um, people talk about heat pumps instead of burning uh, natural gas or oil in the house. Um, so that's another um, uh, electrification use. Uh, and of course, electrifying uh, industry. So there's a big, there's a lot of room for electrification. Not everything's easy to electrify. So people talk about other, uh, people talk about fuels as an energy carrier, and hydrogen is uh, the one talked about the most. Uh, you know, if you look at electricity as an electron, hydrogen is basically a proton. And so um, we have uh, that as a uh, energy carrier. And I'll talk a little more about hydrogen. Uh, in the lectures uh, uh, going forward. Uh, hydrogen uh, is a little easier to transport and store than electricity, but uh, not necessarily uh, totally easy. So people are talking about ammonia, uh, which is uh, basically another, you know, it has a lot of hydrogen in there, and it's, it's a liquid. It's easier to store, easier to move. So... Um, those are what's under discussion for energy carriers. Uh, people also talk about going to synthetic fuels. So um, if you look at trees at, um, or, or other uh, energy crops, um, they, they're in some ways carbon neutral, but not uh, necessarily um, uh, exactly carbon neutral. So, the trees get the CO2 out of the atmosphere, so they're not adding new CO2 uh, coming up from the, uh, um, from the geological formations. Uh, but if we take that and, and say burn wood in a uh, power plant, we're releasing CO2 today. The trees that we cut down may take decades and uh, 70 to 100 years even to totally recover that carbon. Uh, so that becomes controversial on whether uh, biofuels is a good way to go. If we capture the CO2 from those biofuels and put it in the ground, then, we don't, that, then we're not really emitting anything today, and um, they can count as negative emissions as the trees are replaced and, and, and take it out of the atmosphere. So that's one of the carbon dioxide removal strategies. Uh, people are talking about e-fuels, and I think there's a bit of a stretch. I think e-fuels will be extremely expensive, uh, but that's combining uh, hydrogen that's made by electrolysis from uh, carbon-free energy and uh, combining it with CO2. Uh, uh, if it's got CO2, it has to be taken out of the air or, or from uh, biofuels. Otherwise, uh, it's going to go back in the air when you use the e-fuels. Uh, but if you're going to make fuels uh, out of hydrogen and CO2, electrolytic hydrogen from renewables and CO2 from the air are probably your two most expensive feedstocks you can do, and that just yields very expensive uh, fuels. So we're not there yet, but people talk about maybe 20 or 30 years down the road, uh, uh, that may be a, a way to go because they look at... Um, uh, liquid fuels as um, uh, being fairly hard to displace um, uh, in some of the uses they have. So let's talk a little about climate policy and um, what uh, back in 1992 there was something called the Rio um, conference. Uh, they call it the Earth Summit. 
And at the Earth Summit, several uh, very important international agreements uh, were, were made, including uh, one on, say, biodiversity. And one of the ones that's interest, of course, to us is what's called the Framer Convention on Climate Change. And it actually came into force in uh, 1994. And believe it or not, the United States uh, was a signatory to that. And not only that, it passed the Senate. It got two thirds of the votes in the Senate um, uh, to do that. So that was uh, less than 30 years ago. Uh, and, and the politics has changed greatly. Uh, but uh, what that convention said, that every year we're going to have a conference of the parties. So the world community, and there's somewhat something like 190 nations that are uh, part of this, and they come together every year and um, do it. The first meeting was in Berlin in uh, 1995, COP1. And out of that meeting came what was called the Berlin Mandates. Um, and that uh, talked about um, how to implement this and uh, sort of the blueprint uh, for the Kyoto Protocols that came uh, two years later in COP3. Um, the, one of the things the Berlin Mandate did at this time, the developed world had more CO2 emissions than the developing world and said the developed world would lead uh, and help the developing world come along. Um, since then, the developing world now has more emissions than the developed world. And um, this north-south divide uh, still haunts the negotiations today. Uh, the north thinks the south needs to do more and pay more, especially countries like China, which um, are not uh, uh, considered a poor nation anymore. Uh, and um, but those other countries say, well, you, the developed world, uh, you put out most of the CO2 emissions that are in the atmosphere today. You've got to pay more. And of course, when things come down to money like that, uh, it's not easy things to solve. So those, are, those debates are still going on today, and they, they go all the way back to 1995. In 2009, um, there was a meeting in Copenhagen, COP15. And this was uh, billed as a very important meeting at uh, Copenhagen. There was supposed to be uh, a new agreement to replace Kyoto. Um, the United States never ratified Kyoto, so we were never part of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but in Copenhagen, uh, there was supposed to be a new um, protocol to take it. Unfortunately, those negotiations fell apart, and uh, for the next half a decade or so, uh, the climate negotiations were really um, in the wilderness. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol sort of was, you know, had run its course, yet um, uh, there was nothing to replace it. So uh, uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, sent to companies, sent to countries on what to do. Uh, in um, 2015, COP21, they came to the Paris Agreement, and that's what we're operating under now. So the Kyoto Protocol was very top down. It said, we're gonna cut emissions by so much and we're gonna allocate how much uh, is cut by each country. Um, that didn't set well with countries like the United States being told what to do. The P Paris Agreement, it's sort of bottom up. They said, okay, each country is gonna volunteer what you can do to cut emissions. And that was more acceptable, but of course, when you add up all the cuts that the countries volunteered, they're not big enough to meet the goals of a two degree to see or less stabilization in the climate. So that's what is um, going on now. And in fact, this year, 2023, is the first, um, uh, I'm trying to think of exactly where they call it, um, stock taking to look at how each country's doing versus their commitments and, and where the commitments are going and there's uh, pressure for countries to inc increase their commitments. So the last COP was in Egypt in 2022 and this year's COP is going to be in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai uh, uh, starting on November 30th. Uh, it's already quite controversial that the 
uh, basically the chairman of the um, COP is from the host country, and uh, the, the person um, uh, going to be running the uh, meeting in Dubai is head of the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, National Oil Company, and of course that doesn't sit too well uh, with the environmentalist. Uh, per se, that doesn't mean it's, you know, he's bad. In fact, uh, he's got a lot of support from certain quarters, but um, it, it adds more controversy uh, to an already difficult, uh, um, uh, a difficult negotiation. So, um, what about in the U.S., the climate policy? Well, because of our politics, uh, among other things, we've had a failure to legislate a national climate policy. What this has meant is that a lot of things have fallen to the states. So there's state level action. California is uh, uh, probably the leading state in taking action uh, here in the Northeast. And I believe New Jersey's part of it. I know Massachusetts is. We have what's called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse uh, Gas um, initiative, and uh, that puts some, it's not a very strong um, constraint on emissions, but it has some constraint on those emissions uh, in the various states. They actually have auctions uh, for permits uh, uh, that happen once in a while. The permit price is fairly low uh, because the uh, restrictions aren't that um, severe. Um, there's been executive orders and rulemaking from the uh, federal government. And I think uh, probably one of the most interesting things, especially uh, from a combustion point of view, is uh, there's gonna be proposed rulemaking. It's not, it's not officially out yet, but um, uh, uh, the outline of it is, is there, that the EPA is gonna say, okay, by, I, f I forget year, what year, 2030 or 2035, all coal-fired power plants either have to, A, close down, B, capture 90% of their emissions, or C, uh, blend hydrogen in with the methane. So by 2035 or so, uh, you're basically burning pure hydrogen. So uh, those are, are the things, and, and similar things for uh, natural gas power plants. Once again, for baseload natural gas power plants, which I think they define as having a capacity factor of 50% or greater. Very tough, uh, uh, very tough rules if they actually go into force. They'll definitely be challenged in court. Um, and part of what the challenge will be is people will say that carbon capture and storage isn't uh, a proven technology, at least uh, according to uh, <clears throat> what the uh, the rules the EPA has to follow, uh, especially, I think, on natural gas. Uh, we'll talk about that there have been carbon capture uh, and storage projects on coal-fired power plants, but none really on natural gas plants to this point. Uh, and then they get uh, uh, in with larger packages. There's uh, uh, things going, mostly subsidies. Uh, I was at a meeting once. Um, with the industry and the government, and the government said, you know, in the policy, we're going to try to get the right mix of carrots and sticks uh, to help control CO2 emissions. And the people in the industry corrected them, says, no, 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 we're going to get the right mix of carrots, no sticks. And uh, that's basically what's in these bills, uh, a lot of carrots for the industry. Uh, tax credits, so if you buy a, and not just industry people, so if you buy a um, electric vehicle that qualifies, you'll get a good tax credit. Um, so that's, uh, and the way that gets agreed upon is these bills give a little for everybody. So there's something in it for climate change, and there's something in it for, for this group, and something in it for that group. Um, but that's, in the long run, not going to be good enough. Um, there's in the in the environmental community or, or, or the activists for uh, dealing with uh, climate. Uh, there's two 
major viewpoints. Uh, there's obviously things in the middle. There's one viewpoint that's called WWS, wind, water, and solar, saying that's all we need. We don't need carbon capture. We don't need nuclear. I think that they're dead wrong. I, I, it's, it's not proven at all. Um, we, have a, we have really increased a lot of uh, wind and solar, but over the same time, um, over the years that they have increased, we've also increased our use of fossil fuels. The amount of fossil fuels we used, instead of, I forget the exact number, say from 85% may have gone down to 82%. But um, basically what wind and solar have done ha has been um, providing the new capacity needed, but they haven't done a very good job at uh, replacing uh, the fossil fuel use. All of the above means, yes, we need wind, water, and solar. We also need carbon capture. We also need nuclear. And we also need, um, you know, other things. Maybe we need, um, you know, uh, doing things like uh, encouraging mass transit, uh, encouraging uh, behavioral change. So, um, and I'm of that latter group saying that this is a big problem and we're going to need everything we can to throw at it if we're going to uh, keep to our carbon budgets uh, and haul, haul ourselves below 2 degrees C. There's no way we're going to keep ourselves between the 1.5 degrees C, which uh, a lot of people still talk about. So I want to give a little introduction uh, about carbon capture and storage. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll take a, a, a break before, and we'll take some questions and take a break before we go to the next one. So, what is carbon and capture and storage? This is from the IPCC report that was released in uh, 2005, a special report. Uh, I participated in that report. Um, and basically, it says it's a process that consists of three things, separating CO2 from uh, industrials and energy-related gases, so, uh, related sources of uh, CO2, uh, basically mostly gases, uh, transporting them to a storage location, and then long-term uh, isolation from the atmosphere. Uh, we'll talk tomorrow a session on what that means, long-term isolation from the atmosphere, but it means mainly putting them back down in the geologic formations, um, similar to where they came out of either deplete, depleted oil and gas wells or other uh, similar types of formations. Um, oops. Question is, is this feasible? Uh, and the answer is yes, that all these components of a system are commercially available today and we have uh, quite a few demonstrations uh, at the million ton per year level and about 40 million tons of CO2 is being stored today um, from carbon capture and storage technologies. Uh, 40 million is only about, um, what is it, 1% uh, um, uh, of the, uh, I'm sorry, a, a tenth of 1% of the 40 billion that uh, we put out uh, from our energy systems. Um, so why is it limited? And the answer is it's going to always be cheaper to put into the atmosphere unless you have restrictions, uh, what people would call um, sticks uh, in the policy sticks uh, to stop you from putting the atmosphere. It's going to be cheaper uh, to put in the atmosphere than sequester it. And therefore, it's going to be limited to niche opportunities until these policies are put in place. And a lot of these niche opportunities uh, come up from uh, um, the carrots that some of these federal programs uh, uh, give. So let's, let's talk a little about the history of uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, really, the first mention of it in the literature came in a paper from Marchetti. He was uh, with IASA in Austria. And he talked about uh, capturing CO2 and putting it in the outfall of the uh, Waters going through the Straits of Gibraltar, which will sink down into the Atlantic. 
Uh, this wasn't really a, a good feasible option, but it was uh, sort of the first uh, look at the problem and got people thinking. In the 1980s, there were sporadic research uh, in a number of places, including uh, some here in the United States, uh, Meyer Steinberg at uh, uh, Brookhaven National Lab uh, uh, did some uh, work. Uh, the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands was uh, another early uh, um, looking at it. And then uh, uh, at MIT in uh, 1989, we started uh, doing some research also. Uh, the foundation really started getting built in the 1990s. What formed that foundation? There's something called the IEA Greenhouse Gas um, uh, Program that was formed in uh, 1991. This is an implementing a agreement under the um, um, I IEA. So the IEA in Paris, they have probably 30 or 40 implementing agreements which are saying, okay, you're gonna look at this subject, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's nuclear or whatever, and you form a little, um, under our auspices, you'll form a program, and then you have to get members to come in and support that. So this was, uh, came in, so basically support uh, carbon capture and storage technologies. In Japan, they formed an institute called Wright. Um, uh, so this is uh, uh, research for innovative technologies for the earth, I think what, what it stands for. And once again, its major focus was carbon capture and storage. Uh, the DOE officially started its program in 1998, even though it funded some research before then, but it became a line item in the uh, budgets in 1998. In Australia, they had something called the CO2 CRC, which, which was again a big industrial consortium of uh, public and private um, uh, things. And uh, an international conference series was uh, initiated the first one was called International Conference of Carbon Dioxide Removal in Amsterdam in March of 1992. Uh, about 250 people attended. I was there. It was sort of the first meeting of the international community. Uh, it was organized by the people at the University of Utrecht, which were uh, some of the first papers published uh, in the field. Uh, we changed the name of the meeting uh, in 1998 to, to GHGT, Greenhouse um, greenhouse gas uh, technologies. Um, and uh, the first of those conference was number four, uh, given that there were three ICCDRs before. And there was an interlocking in Switzerland in 1998. Uh, we just had uh, uh, GHGT 16 in Lyon, France uh, last fall. And 17 is going to be a year from October in uh, Calgary up in Canada. So these are the big meetings uh, that bring people together around the world uh, for that. So this foundation was laid in the 90s. Um, some of the other milestones. Uh, in 1996, there was the first uh, project at a million ton a year level. This was a Sleipner project in um, the North Sea in Norway. Uh, basically, it was, uh, it was on a platform. Natural gas was coming out of the North Sea, too much CO2 in there for the pipeline. It had to be removed, so they removed it. But instead of putting it in the uh, atmosphere, as is normally done, they actually uh, dug a well and re-injected it in the North Sea into a, into a, a saline formation. Uh, that's, that did not have hydrocarbons in it, and that's been operating continuously now for uh, over 25 years. Uh, I mentioned uh, the IPCC special report on carbon capture and storage. That was uh, also very important, sort of given the technology and international legitimacy um, uh, it, um, for the world. So there's a uh, copy of it, or what it looks like. Um, the last slide I'm going to show sort of talks about the ups and downs uh, of carbon capture for the last uh, quarter century. And I have um, three different uh, metrics. And all these metrics are um, normalized uh, 
to the year uh, 2010 uh, to, as one. So they're, so they're normalized to one there. Uh, the yellow dots, I had a, um, uh, are the attendees at the uh, Greenhouse Gas Technologies Conference. Um, and you can see, and the red dots are, I had an industrial consortium. This was the members of my industrial consortium on carbon capture. And the blue dots are uh, the number of projects in the uh, pipeline that's done each year from the Global CCS Institute. Uh, they just start, the numbers for there only go back to 2010. But you can see they all follow uh, a similar shape that, uh, you know, we were laying the foundation in the 90s, and then uh, interest started to grow, and it basically peaked um, just around 2010. And what happened in 2010? That was COP15. That was the meeting in Copenhagen where climate policy fell apart. So all the money going in here from governments, from industry, said, okay, we're, we're building this technology because we think we're going to need it, and then all of a sudden, Climate policy failed and says, we don't know when the markets are going to develop or even if the markets are going to develop because we need climate policy to develop them. So uh, the interest decreased uh, until about 2018 or so. And what happened in 2018? Uh, there were several things, but uh, I like to use the, uh, another IPCC special report this was on 1.5 degrees uh, uh, stabilization, uh, saying A, we're running out of time, and B, sort of highlighting what the impacts would be if we miss the 1.5 degrees C um, or even the 2 degrees C stabilization. And at that point, uh, interest increased, and you can see that by the number of uh, projects in the pipeline here. And uh, as of last year's report, uh, the 2022 report, there were 196 projects uh, in the pipeline worldwide. So, the inc so that's where we pretty much are today. Uh, a lot of interest. Uh, there's some money coming in, and we're just going to have to see where it goes. So I'm going to stop there, see if there's any questions, and we'll take a break. And uh, we'll come back and start looking at uh, details of how we actually do carbon capture. Questions? Okay, why don't we uh, take a break, come back in 15 minutes. Thank you.